Now, before we start the video in full, keep in mind that although there is a lot of relevance in this piece to Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, this isn't like my previous video that focuses specifically on Fallout and Bethesda's understanding of it. This video will deal with analysing Bethesda's post-Daggerfall design mentality and the kind of impact it has on the role-playing and sandbox genres at large. Abstraction. The process in which rules and concepts are derived from the usage of literal specific events and examples. They are the cornerstone of the RPG genre because it is by abstraction that we define all interactions within an RPG. It's the rule set. It's the character system. It's the skill system. It is the foundation upon which role-playing games are built because there is no other method upon which to enforce success and failure for actions outside of undertaking the specific action yourself. As such, it is highly tied to the notion that you and your character are separate entities. A very rough example here, skill checks in RPGs are a form of abstraction. You aren't making a diplomatic argument yourself, in hopes that the bandit leader will back down from terrorizing a village. What you are doing is you are choosing to utilize a predefined skill, and the game will determine its success or failure based on semi-random dice rolls or your interaction with the game systems, i.e. how high is your skill level. There is a layer of abstraction there that the player recognizes is necessary for the game to function, and it is the combination of game content and underlying systems that you are able to make decisions and roleplay through those kinds of situations. Furthermore, it is through the interplay of strong systems and content built around it that creates gameplay depth in RPGs, not writing or content on its own. Many people would say that the Knights of the Old Republic games are very well written, but few would argue they contain a lot of gameplay depth, and not gameplay mechanics or systems on its own either. Pillars of Eternity, for example, had very elaborate stronghold mechanics as well as factional reputation systems and personal reputation systems, but this only gave it the illusion of depth, as very few of these mechanics actually played a real part of your playing experience. So, it's the interplay of content and mechanics that's important, because it's that interplay that allows you to experience different things based on how you choose to interact with the game. Games that have stealth systems, for example, allow you to complete tasks in different ways, but that only works if the level design, quest design, and writing accommodate for it. The role-playing aspect comes into the equation by allowing the player to form a consistent mental framework that they are able to rely upon to make decisions in the game. This is true regardless of whether the game focuses on combat through different playstyles and builds, focuses on decision points through different skill sets and dialogue options, or focuses on something else entirely. So to summarize, it's the combination of gameplay content and gameplay systems that creates depth, and a focus on logical abstraction is absolutely critical in ensuring that the players are able to reconcile otherwise unrealistic gameplay content or gameplay mechanics so that the suspension of disbelief isn't broken. Think of the idea of attributes. Having a statistic for physical strength or agility isn't realistic, but it's logical in the sense that you can understand what it means and what it represents in the context of the game. So, why is this important? Well, it's quite simple really. Bethesda hates abstraction that leads to complexity in game mechanics. Sometimes, this can result in positive changes, removing two hit percentages in games that utilize real-time action combat, like they did after Morrowind is such a change. This is because enforcing two hit percentages without also providing adequate visual feedback for the hidden dice rolls directly contradicts the player's input, and as a general rule, that's something you never want to do. They probably could have made a system that works with the dice rolls if they made combat slower, weightier, and added dodging animations for missed hits, but most of their action RPG contemporaries opt for removing dice roll combat as well, so I'm not going to fault them on that. I mean, overall, it was a positive change. However, other times can demonstrate that the changes aren't so positive like removing the entire skill system in the lead up to Fallout 4's release. Fallout's special system had layered character progression and abstraction systems. The first layer had special or attributes, the second layer had skills, and the final layer had perks, and each of these represent a different dimension of a character or person. The original games and New Vegas had traits as well, which were pretty nifty, but not really relevant to the discussion. The attributes of special represented a character's baseline physical and mental characteristics. Strength, perception, endurance, you get the idea. 
Skills, meanwhile, represent the range of actions that they could undertake, as well as their proficiency in such. Speech, small guns, first aid, etc, etc. Whilst Perks represents the final layer, extra touches that made your character unique. By merging them all into the one system, the ability for meaningful character customization has diminished. Did you enjoy, for example, dialogue skill checks where you demonstrated your handyman skills, your haggling abilities, or your scientific knowledge? Or did you enjoy going out of your way to make a flirtatious heartthrob or even a gay or lesbian character for the explicit purpose of having unique dialogue options? You did? Well, that's too bad. I mean, who needs character customization in an RPG anyway when the protagonist is voiced? Sorry if that sounded a bit snarky, but that's just one example of why RPG mechanics and complex systems of logical abstraction are important. So, why does Bethesda hate abstraction? Mainstream appeal. It simply comes down to the ability to move more copies and relate their marketing to the largest possible audience. Abstraction in role-playing games appear in the form of numbers, mechanics, and systems that remind the player that they are interacting with the game. We've all heard of the derogatory comments about spreadsheet RPGs, and that's really what it boils down to. Bethesda's entire marketing angle is hinged on the idea of selling an experience. It's not a game, it's an experience. The appeal of a fantasy spreadsheet game is somewhat limited, but the appeal of an open world fantasy experience where you can do anything, go anywhere, now that is much larger. I mean, see that mountain? You can climb it. In this scenario, the role-playing genre is merely an anchor upon which Bethesda can promise a unique experience. This is why Bethesda games feel less and less like RPGs to classic RPG fans when each installment of their games come out. Now, contrary to what some people might say or think, it's not necessarily the wide mainstream appeal that makes the shallow sandbox experience a somewhat cancerous philosophy for the genre. I don't begrudge a company making popular and successful games, clearly, it's a winning formula for Bethesda, but what I take issue with is how Bethesda chooses to go about getting that audience. You can get married in the game, and I had decided to marry this one woman who was my friend, and I had forgot that I had done this radiant quest for this other guy, who it turns out had liked her. I turned around and as she was standing there, I saw another door open to another bedroom and the other guy walked out. If you make him like her, he then visits her every day, and doesn't care if she's married. By removing abstraction systems and RPG mechanics from each iteration of a series, what then needs to happen to keep the same level of quality is to fill it with handcrafted content that demonstrate an attention to detail. In a very broad sense, this refers to the sliding scale of content versus mechanics with, say, Mass Effect on one end while having Mount and Blade on the other. In the Elder Scrolls series, this is most profound in the transition between Daggerfall to Morrowind. Daggerfall had a plethora of mechanics, factional gameplay focused on randomness, and had an absolutely massive landmass that encouraged a genuine sandbox experience. This was scaled down immensely for the more tightly designed and more reactive Morrowind. Now speaking from a personal perspective, Morrowind is still very enjoyable despite suffering many of the same issues that its successors have and having many issues by itself. Uh, the general idea though is that handcrafted content that reacts to player decisions is used as a substitute for open, complex and interactive mechanics. This allows for genuine interactive role playing to occur and is how you meld gameplay mechanics with storytelling to produce a profound effect on players. In the hands of a truly skilled developer, it is possible to leverage world design, content design like quests, writing, etc, and atmosphere, along with game mechanics to portray an internally consistent universe. It doesn't necessarily have to simulate a fantasy world, but it is one that is able to uphold suspension of disbelief through a combination of compelling gameplay and mechanics that are contextualized by the narrative. And the result of that is the highly sought after state known as immersion. But what Bethesda does instead is create an imitation fantasy world. They do this through simulationist mechanics that operate only on the game's outer surface, as well as through modular design. And the result of that is a world which, 
on first inspection, promises meaningful experiences, but delivers on little because there is no real depth to it. It neither has the systems of abstraction that provide interactive role-playing mechanics, nor the strongly designed content that takes advantage of said mechanics to be a truly powerful role-playing experience. How many times do you hear gamers, journalists, and even developers ask, sometimes beg you to use your imagination to paper over the logical gaps and holes in Bethesda's writing and world design? Since Fallout 4's launch is imminent, I'm just going to address this briefly. Now, I'm not going to spoil the ending for anyone, but Pete Hines, who is the Vice President of Bethesda, his comments on the Fallout 4 ending circulation on the internet is a fantastic example. On Twitter, he urged people not to worry about the spoilers because the world is big and you can create your own story. But the reason the spoilers have cut deep for many people outside of the fact that it's a story spoiler for a game that people are excited about outside of that is because it potentially exposes the ending as weakly written and linear in nature. In essence, if the leaks are to be believed, it's ham-fisted and doesn't respect the player's choices over the course of the game, and it doesn't respect their intelligence in a general sense either. Of course, I may be jumping the gun here since the game isn't out and we don't know what the endings are in their entirety, so feel free to correct me and call me out if Fallout 4's ending sequence respects the player's choices over the course of the game, thereby making it the player's own story, and respects the player's intelligence by giving them a well-written resolution to the story. So yeah, if that happens, let me know. Now, to get off the subject of Fallout 4 and to talk about Bethesda's games in a more general sense, Bethesda games often have impressive feature lists compared to their RPG competitors. In the overwhelming majority of cases, these features are advertised and praised as quote-unquote optional content. However, they are made utterly unimportant to the experience as a whole as a result. Basically, they feature zero inherent meaning or depth to the greater game. Now, this is why I like to say that Bethesda games have breadth, but not depth. Features like Marriage in Skyrim ironically divorced from the rest of the game. The mechanic itself is also quite shallow. You just wear a necklace and if the NPC likes you enough, off you go. It is a surface deep system that is functionally equivalent to a mini game and Bethesda games are becoming increasingly filled with them. Todd Howard's cockledry anecdote plays out entirely in his head, and although unexpected moments and experiences like that can be very memorable, they are incidental rather than intentional on the game's part. As a result, they ought to be supported by a foundation of strong gameplay mechanics and content. However, Bethesda isn't selling games, they're selling experiences, and little anecdotes can help to sell that image to players. In every new iteration of either Elder Scrolls or Fallout, the significant changes they make reflect this direction. By that, I mean removing role-playing mechanics and interwoven content, instead relying on poorly done simulation systems that are segregated from the rest of the game to create an imitation fantasy world. Our new Radiant AI system it allows NPCs to have full, 24-7 schedules. These NPCs are not scripted. We give them general goals, and they figure out on their own how to accomplish them. The result? Bethesda are creating hollow worlds. Worlds that require the player to find meaning and depth of their own accord. Admittedly, there is a lot of interesting lore shown through the texts and notes of Bethesda games, but how relevant are they to the actual game? The Imperial Library makes for comfy reading on a Sunday afternoon, but when the lore is mostly ignored, irrelevant, or even contradicted at times by what you do in the game, then you can't attribute that as a positive for the game's design. While all this might seem like a good thing, finding your own meaning, it actually encourages players and the media to view games with an uncritical eye. It's this attitude that enables Bethesda to violate basic narrative principles in the way they create their worlds. It even allows them to push the responsibility onto the player base for things that they should do themselves, such as maintaining suspension of disbelief, as well as maintaining a logically coherent in-game universe. The reason why this mindset is so bad and is frankly cancerous is because it conditions the audience into accepting blame when they are dissatisfied with the final product. When companies provide them with objectively bad writing 
and objectively cut down gameplay mechanics. They're told to quote unquote roleplay and use their imagination, as if somehow it's the player's fault. And companies aren't motivated to do better, because they are never held to account for what they produce. One of the things we do, particularly given the success of Skyrim, is you get a lot more data on how people experience an open game, so we don't want to give that up. We will sacrifice certain things to make it completely open, and whereas in other games you can be on a quest or something, on our game we can be on every quest at once. Bethesda pride themselves on a design philosophy that emphasises player freedom. To this end, they have always stressed on removing barriers from the player's path, and promoted the idea that the player is responsible for their own story. It's an empowering concept, but also a flawed one with how they design games. They remove mechanical complexity in their games under the guise of streamlining and accessibility, while designing games that are modular in nature. Marriage is separate from guild progression, is separate from faction progression, is separate from house building, is separate from Daedric artifacts, is separate from the main quest, and so on and so forth. They're all segregated by design. Supposedly, this is done to maximise the amount of activities a player can undertake in a single playthrough. Do anything, be anything, avoid saying no to the player. This goes back to the idea that Bethesda creates shallow sandbox experiences resulting in a fake immersive world that exists only on the surface, rather than actually containing the properties of an immersive world. Nowhere is this sentiment more pronounced than with the introduction of essential NPCs. First featured in Oblivion, certain NPCs were flagged as unkillable because Bethesda didn't want to jeopardise their quest content. On the face of things, this sounds reasonable. However, they are marketing a game that promises freedom and the ability to do anything, be anyone. Between Oblivion, Fallout 3 and Skyrim, around 20% of the game's population is rendered invincible. Bethesda are so afraid of the thin veneer of their games being shattered that they insulate the player from any kind of meaningful failure or consequence to their actions. Is that really necessary? Mm, no, I don't think you're him. So despite the robust feature set and large landscape, their games fall apart very quickly once you tread away from the path they've carefully constructed for you. Other sandbox games retain the ability to provide the player with meaningful gameplay experiences based on the interplay of mechanics and world alone, even if that means that quest content is lost, ignored or failed. Daggerfall had this in spades, Morrowind does to a much lesser extent. Beyond exploration, which in itself has been made risk-free and convenient, there's not much else in Bethesda games that can keep a player's attention. Which is a weird statement to make about a company that prides itself on massive worlds and player freedom, but it goes to show that Bethesda's sandbox freedom, as seen in their newest titles, is a falsity and exists only on the game's surface. But it goes further than that. In post-Morrowind Elder Scrolls, this paradoxical obsession with risk-free player freedom has meant that Bethesda actively shies away from designing mutually exclusive content in meaningful ways. In Morrowind, guild progression was gated via skill proficiencies. You couldn't advance in the Fighters Guild, for example, unless you impressed key figures in the guild via quests and tasks and demonstrated skills relevant to being a fighter. By the time Skyrim came around, these restrictions were removed for the sake of accessibility, leading to the potentially absurd situation of you being an archmage not even knowing basic spells. Guild questlines no longer offer the player the feeling of genuine progression and mastery. What they offer instead is a linear narrative story that ends in the player advancing up the ranks for contrived reasons. And the result is that the player feels like a tourist being led around, as opposed to feeling like a genuine guild member who is really progressing up through the ranks. In addition, the segmented design of these quest lines ensure that there is no conflict between them, despite the clear enmity that they demonstrate for one another in the story. In Morrowind, choosing a great house brought you into conflict with the other great houses, 
Choosing the Fighters Guild brought you into conflict with the Thieves Guild and so on and so forth. You could play several sides, but there was always a breaking point where you were forced to choose. When combined with the advancement mechanics within these power structures, it allowed the player to invest in what they were doing emotionally because it was underpinned by significant time and gameplay investment as well. When you don't build on a strong foundation of player investment and appropriate reactivity for choices, quest lines that otherwise emphasize choice results in meaningless choice. This is why one of the quest lines that actually features mutually exclusive content in Skyrim, the Civil War, is so bland. It's toothless. Bethesda is intent on not allowing players to miss out on meaningful content as a result of their choices. So what happens is that they blunt any potential impact choices could have on their game. At the end of the day, you can still shop and make small talk with the guards in solitude dressed with Stormcloak garb after killing the Emperor and taking over several Imperial fortresses in the area. Unless you go out of your way to declare your allegiances to the characters that you're talking to, which is a bit much. So, if your decisions lack meaning, then how can you feel like you're playing your own story? A Fallout 3 had 200 different endings, if you can believe it, but how many of them actually felt meaningful and unique? The focus on freedom to the detriment of reactivity and investment on the part of the players is key to why Bethesda's games ironically have few real choices, why the games are shallow in nature and why they are poor as role-playing games. In response to these criticisms, people are told to quote-unquote role-play or set limits without any real understanding of how role-playing as a gaming genre and concept is distinctive from a generic idea of simply playing pretend. For example, Super Mario Bros. as a postmodern analysis on race relations told through the dream of an Olympic high jumper desperate to liberate his gold princess from the clutches of a foreign rival. That nonsense holds the same narrative weight as the idea that in Skyrim your dragonborn can become archmage without knowing a single spell because your political prowess and leadership overpowered the need to be a formidable wizard logically it occupies the same level of nonsense. Simply put, the developer shouldn't be given credit for depth and meaning that isn't actually in the game. However, with Morrowind, I think that our kind of game appeals to a wider audience given the game's success among more casual gamers who are neither hardcore nor RPG geeks. It turns out people like the kind of options and freedom we give them, and the pretty graphics don't hurt either. This essentially explains why Bethesda chooses to design their games the way they do, better than I could ever hope to explain. Games that appeal to wider audiences of casual gamers, not RPG fans, not core gamers, people who enjoy quote-unquote options, freedom, and pretty graphics. I wholeheartedly acknowledge that many changes Bethesda has made over the years with all of their games have made them more palatable to a wider audience, and the sales figures from Morrowind to Oblivion to Skyrim are proof of that. By removing abstraction and logical restrictions on the player, Bethesda sacrifices genuine role-playing, world-building, narrative and gameplay challenge for the sake of marketing their open experiences to a wider audience. But by chipping away at the foundations of their game's mechanics for this sort of fake simulation world and relying on modular design, they've discouraged wholehearted investment into their games. By emphasizing a pick up and play mentality where nothing is really meaningful, they're creating disposable games with little inherent worth. And that's just anathema to immersion. The deeply unfortunate aspect about all of this is that commercial success equals quality in the game industry. Every publisher and every developer is looking for the next mega hit. Bethesda's design philosophy of shallow sandbox experiences is essentially like junk food or fast food. There's no inherent wrong in enjoying junk food. It's cheap, it's quick, it's disposable, it's popular and it's tasty. However, you wouldn't claim that McDonald's is the best restaurant in the world, now would you? Or if you are an avid book fan, you wouldn't say that Twilight is the best book ever written. Yet this is what Bethesda games are to the role-playing genre. For all the vitriol leveled at the Call of Duty franchise in the gaming community, Bethesda makes the Call of Duty equivalent in the RPG genre. The problem is that due to Bethesda's success, we have seen a generation of game designers and gamers who are hoodwinked into believing that Bethesda's mindset of a shallow sandbox experience is the only way to create 
an immersive open world RPG. For people who want to claim that Bethesda games are still hardcore RPGs because they still have stats or whatever, look, every game ever made can be boiled down to stats and numbers. That's just the nature of computer software, ones and zeros. What makes a role-playing game isn't necessarily its stats, it's how they're used and what they represent, basically the systems of abstraction. Now, if you hate traditional RPGs, or if you like the direction that Bethesda is going in, then more power to you. They do specifically what they do to attract a mainstream audience, so the people who support what they do vastly outnumber those who don't. I'm not going to deny that, not even for a second. I just happen to be part of that minority, and I hope that developers, designers, or gamers who read this or listen to this video can understand the perspective from which it is written before dismissing it as a whole. Because at the rate Bethesda are streamlining their games, Elder Scrolls 6 and Fallout 5 will become functionally identical to game series like Far Cry. When that happens, the only thing that makes Bethesda games RPGs at all is marketing. Nothing more. Empty words of PR spokesmen and their paid for press. If you care about the state of RPGs as a gamer, that can't be good news. I do apologise for this piece being a bit more ranty than the last one, it's certainly not as coherent as I feel it should be, but it's been something I've wanted to get off my chest for a while now. Anyway, if you've had the willpower to stick it out and watch or listen to the whole thing until the very end, then I thank and commend you whether you agree with my points or vehemently disagree with what I have to say. I'm eager to know your opinions and I hope you will share them with me in the comments section. I think this will probably be my last Bethesda video for a while unless something emerges out of Fallout 4 that really demands it, but for now I think I'll focus on content about other development studios or other things altogether. For the most part, I've said what I wanted to say about Bethesda, and I thank you all for giving me a platform to share it, even if your only response to me is to tell me to kill myself. So thank you all, and have a great day.